All right, over to you, Jessica. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this webinar event, Supporting Electric School Buses in New Hampshire. I'm Jessica Wilcox, coordinator for the Granite State Clean Cities Coalition and a grants manager at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Brianna Brand, Senior Program Director at Clean Energy New Hampshire and coordinator for Drive Electric New Hampshire. Brianna? Thanks, Jessica. I'm just gonna provide a few quick housekeeping items for everybody. So all attendees are currently in listen only mode, but we would love to have everyone participate actively in the webinar by asking questions. So you can do this by entering any question you might have into the pane on your webinar control panel. We do ask that if you throughout the presentation have a question that would be best answered by a certain panelist, please enter their name into the question box just so we're able to accurately direct that question. And we have saved about 30 minutes towards the end of the webinar for Q&A. So there will be plenty of opportunity to uh, get your questions answered. Also, we do want to note that this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting the recording shortly on the Granite State Clean Cities website, as well as the Drive Electric New Hampshire website. So keep a lookout for that and feel free to share this webinar with your networks. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jessica. Great, thanks, Brianna. So with the impact of the COVID-19 respiratory disease that's affecting our most vulnerable, now more than ever, zero tailpipe emissions vehicles are key to a healthier community. To transition from investigation to implementation, you need to make a plan. Today, we're gonna to provide you with tools and tips to aid in that process. We've brought together an expert group of presenters to share their knowledge, experience, and best practices for developing and moving forward with a school bus electrification project. Now we're gonna start with a couple of quick polls to find out who we have with us today. Go ahead, Brianna. All right, so our first poll is what type of organization are you affiliated with? So if you can please enter in, whether you are with a school district or a city or town, a school bus provider, an energy committee or commission, a renewable energy provider, or another type of affiliation. And we'll leave this open just for another few seconds. Okay. And let's see the response. Excellent. It'd be interesting if we had added advocate on there as well. I think a lot of those wow. others might be people who want to advocate for the technology. Yeah, true. Good point, Ryan. So we can go to our next poll and see. Now, if you are affiliated with a school district, do you own, contract, or lease your school buses? So we'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. Okay, so let's see the results from this poll. Looks like a lot of, a lot of leasing. And a decent amount of don't know. <laughs> well, excellent. Thank you everybody for responding. This is very helpful. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, I'm the coordinator for the Granite State Clean Cities Coalition, and our coalition is housed at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and is part of a nationwide network of nearly 100 clean cities coalitions supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, or DOE. We work to advance alternative fuels, such as electric, propane, natural gas, and biodiesel, advanced technology vehicles, such as electric and hybrid, 
and fuel reduction strategies such as idle reduction. Our coalition is made up of over 140 stakeholders, including an eight-member advisory board, and consists of public and private fleets, such as state, municipal, utilities, fuel and beverage supply companies, businesses such as fuel providers and vehicle manufacturers, and municipalities such as schools and universities, regional planning commissions, and energy and sustainability committees. We are a fuel neutral and technology neutral coalition, working as a resource for our stakeholders that are implementing these types of alternative fuel vehicles and equipment projects into their fleets, businesses, towns, and cities. Our mission is to improve air quality and foster economic development in New Hampshire's transportation sector through partnerships and projects that promote petroleum reduction strategies. We do this through education and outreach, such as stakeholder meetings and site visits, ribbon cuttings, newsletters, conferences, and events such as our biennial Green Your Fleet workshop at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway, shown in the center, slide, uh, center photo on the slide. And then last year, September, our last September's Bi-State EV Connector at Hypertherm in Lebanon, many of you may have participated in that. We participate in programs such as the Federal Highway Administration's Alternative Fuel Corridor designation, which is developing a nationwide network of alternative fuel and charging infrastructure on highway corridors. New Hampshire's principal highways were evaluated against set criteria and designated as either corridor ready or corridor pending. An example of an electric vehicle or EV corridor is a highway or a section of a highway that has DC fast charging every 50 miles and no further than five miles from the highway. The last picture on this slide reflects New Hampshire's EV corridors. We have some that are EV ready, for example, the FV Everett Turnpike from the New Hampshire border to I-293 in Bedford, and some that are pending, for example, I-89 from Lebanon to Concord. So if you're working on EV charging projects in your community, these designations can serve as a guide for identifying and prioritizing sites that support these corridors. In fact, these designations were used to inform the Volkswagen DC fast charging RFP that was released last year and is being revised for re-release in the near future. Additionally, we've been working with the New Hampshire Department of Transportation to finalize the corridor signage plan. Signs have been manufactured and an installation is in process with EV signage going up on I-93 and I-95 and additional signage is being planned. So it's a great way to promote the existence of charging along our principal travel corridors. It's anticipated that future federal funding may be directed for building out infrastructure on the designated corridors. However, it's important that we strive to move these pending corridors that we have to ready corridors so that we can support EV travel and the installation of signs. Slide change, please. So in 2019, our coalition stakeholders reduced their use of petroleum by over 1.3 million gallons of gasoline equivalent and reduced greenhouse gas emissions by over 8,200 tons. So not just a drop in the barrel. In New Hampshire, consideration for alternative fuel school buses has taken root. SAU 6 in Claremont and Student Transportation of America for Conville School District in Peterborough have incorporated propane school buses into their fleet. And Manchester Transit Authority is procuring 14 propane school buses resulting from a Volkswagen funding award, five of which you can see in the bottom left photo. But while these examples represent a shift towards cleaner fuels and technologies, transitioning takes time. And meanwhile, current aging diesel school buses continue to be a dangerous source of airborne emissions for New Hampshire's most vulnerable population. Next slide, please. School buses transport our most valuable resource, our children. The New Hampshire school bus fleet consists of an estimated 2,700 school buses transporting approximately 173,000 children. There are around 850 class four or larger school buses in New Hampshire, of which about 90% are diesel powered. As you can see from this list, there are various health implications related to diesel exhaust. It is a group one carcinogen that increases the risk for developing asthma, lung cancer, and other respiratory diseases. This is compounded by the fact that children's lungs are not fully developed and they have faster breathing rates, breathing 50% more air per pound of body weight than adults. According to a 2019 report by the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, 7.2% or about 18,000 New Hampshire children had asthma in 2015. Next slide, please. In fact, over 40% of greenhouse gas emissions produced in New Hampshire comes from the transportation sector. Additionally, school buses, along with other heavy-duty trucks and buses, are one of the largest contributors of nitrogen oxide or NOx emissions. 
NOx contributes to summertime smog and poor air quality days. And for human health, NOx emissions can cause respiratory conditions, such as inflammation of the airways. With zero tailpipe emissions, electric school buses present one solution. Slide, please. A visit to the U.S. Department of Energy's Alternative Fuel Data Center reveals several manufacturers engaged in school bus electrification with type A, C, and D offerings. Of note, Bluebird, powered by Cummins Electric Propulsion System, offers three electric bus types with up to 120 miles of range. They also offer a dedicated thermal management system for the battery to, min to minimize climate impacts. Lion, who will be presenting a bit later, designs and manufactures their buses to be 100% electric offering three bus types with up to 155 miles of range. And Thomasville, powered by Proterra, offers a type C with up to 120 miles of range. Next slide, please. Per the Department of Energy's A-Fleet tool, an electric school bus averages around $290,000. Despite higher upfront costs compared to diesel, the total cost of ownership can be less when you factor in reduced operating costs, with no oil changes or moving parts. And on average, an electric school bus could save schools nearly 2,000 a year in fuel and 4,400 a year in maintenance costs, along with the fact that electric school buses are clean and quiet. Electric vehicle capability and technology is rapidly progressing. The cost of EV batteries has decreased from over 1,100 per kilowatt hour in 2010 to just under, or just 156 in 2019. So as this continues to fall, so will the cost to electrify. Next slide, please. In order to move the needle from investigation to implementation, there are a few things to consider. Assembling a team. You need to engage decision makers and subject matter experts in planning. There's power in numbers. Consider the school board, superintendent, transportation provider, utility, energy committee, school bus provider, charging station provider. You should also evaluate your bus routes against the range of electric buses to identify where an electric bus might fit best and potential charging needs. And you should investigate your charging infrastructure needs. Work with your utility. Eversource in particular says that they start, that you should start with the account exec or your community relationship specialist. They can advise on, on when to involve the engineering team to perform a site review, determine capacity upgrades, costs, et cetera. It can take anywhere from six to 12 months to get infrastructure permits, power upgrades, and installation complete, so it's important to begin planning early. Next slide, please. So the federal government is involved in providing solutions to alleviate diesel emissions. Funding for the replacement of diesel school buses has been available through EPA's National Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, or DERA. This is historically offered on an annual basis for projects that reduce emissions from existing diesel engines, and school buses are eligible for this funding. Note that this particular funding is best suited for larger projects. This is the national program. So consider reaching out to your regional planning commission about opportunities to submit maybe a regional project proposal. Next slide, please. In addition, EPA's national school bus rebate program has offered annual funding for schools, municipalities, and transportation providers to, re to replace older diesel school buses. In 2019, eligible buses needed to be model year 2006 or older, and the rebate, which must be applied for in advance of purchase, was 15,000 or 20,000, depending on the gross vehicle weight rating. Next slide, please. The New Hampshire Clean Diesel Grant Program uses EPA zero funding along with Volkswagen funding as a match to receive a bonus. As a result, last year's program had nearly 800,000 available of which electric vehicle projects were eligible for up to 45% funding, which could also be applied towards charging units. So we anticipate a new round of funding will be available in the fall, and this usually opens in October. Next slide. The Volkswagen settlement provides another opportunity for New Hampshire fleet, since school buses are an eligible mitigation activity. The state is receiving a total of approximately 30.9 million from the settlement, and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services is working with the lead agency, the New Hampshire Office of Strategic Initiatives. And last year around this time, they released a funding opportunity for electric school buses. Unfortunately, no applications were submitted. However, 9.3 million has been set aside for the replacement of eligible vehicles owned by municipal governments, and this includes school districts. 
So we anticipate that there may be another school bus funding opportunity, but we don't have a timetable for one. It's our hope, though, that by connecting you with today's presenters and resources, you will be empowered to develop a plan and ready your community for the right opportunity. Next slide, please. A couple of other funding and financing options that I'd like to highlight are New Hampshire's Community Development Science Authority. They're very interested in supporting this effort where possible through their Clean Energy Fund financing. For communities that may not bond for this investment, they can provide low interest financing with loans up to $500,000. For example, for a municipality's copay if they get Volkswagen funding or other grant funding. And these loans could also be used to support charging infrastructure. The New Hampshire Electric Cooperative's EV charging station incentives for municipal members. They offer 50% up to $2,500 with a max of 5,000 for two charging installations per property. The Climate Mayor's EV electric vehicle, EV and EV charging station purchased in Collaborative. This is a procurement platform which leverages collective buying power to reduce the cost of EVs and charging infrastructure for all US cities, counties, state governments, and public universities. The Collaborative also provides training, best practices, educational resources, and analysis to support electric vehicle transitions for public fleet. Of note, DOE recently released a case study regarding the 2016 pilot program in Massachusetts that we'll be hearing more about from our presenters. And you can read more about it at the details on the, um, at, at the link on the slide. So for additional resources, please do also visit the US Department of Energy's Alternative Fuel Data Center Tools page. And note that you can always contact the DOE's Technical Response Service for assistance with any technical questions. Next slide. So as we move forward in our discussion, I want to emphasize the importance of collaboration. From engaging your community members to connecting with other interested New Hampshire school districts, from reaching out to neighboring states such as Vermont and Maine who are transitioning to electric school buses, to talking with the school bus and charging station providers. If you need assistance, the Granite State Clean Cities Coalition has access to a nationwide network and we can get you connected. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me and thank you for your time on this. Next up, our keynote speaker is Stephen Russell. Steve recently retired from his position as the Alternative Transportation Program Coordinator and Clean Cities Co-Coordinator for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In his tenure, he developed an electric vehicle infrastructure plan and policy, coordinated the installation of charging stations throughout the Commonwealth, and engineered events that led to the development of a statewide plan for electric vehicle infrastructure. Steve has been managing fleets for over 20 years, including the City of Keene, New Hampshire's municipal fleet. Steve will be sharing some insights for Massachusetts 2016 electric school bus pilot project, a first of its kind deployment in cold weather environments. Steve, over to you. Great. It certainly is my pleasure to be here this afternoon and, and be able to share some knowledge, of, come out of retirement to share some knowledge on, on this great um, pilot we did. Um, it all started with a conversation with our Secretary of Energy, Rick Sullivan, one day. He's, he had just come back from the Clinton Global Initiative in, in California and was, <laughs> it was very interesting. He says, Steve, they're doing electric school buses in California. We should do that here. Uh, what's it going to take to do an electric school bus pilot? And I went, I don't know. So I, I worked on it. I, I did an RFI. I did some investigation. And about six months later, I went back to him and said, gee, you know, if I had $1.8 million, we could probably do a pilot, maybe three or four buses. And you got it. So the end result of it is, and, and I started out with, with, an, with the intent to do it myself. And and after looking at all the, the necessary procurement rules that go along with the state agency, it, it behooved me to um, work with a consulting firm to do that. And we, we hired Vermont Energy uh, Investment Corp and, and they kind of ran herd on the thing and it was great. And, and our goal, as you can see in the slide, was to, you know, to really use the electric school bus in regular service. We didn't want this to be like the the, the, the sports team bus so it was used once a month. We wanted it to be every day hauling children back and forth to school. Um, our, our overall goal was also to deal with vehicle to grid and use the battery as energy storage. And, and that technology was way too early. So we, you know, we still have it in our heart to do something, but in, I think what's gonna happen is these new buses that are manufactured will have that capability. So stay tuned to that. So. Um, 
we wanted to advance the technology with educational awareness. And we have a, a nice video that um, we'll give you the link to. It's, it's, it's a great video you can put in front of a school board and, and they'll probably say, let's buy 10 buses. So I'm hoping that that'll be helpful for you. Um, we really wanted to reduce the petroleum in the bus operations. And as Jessica has outlined, you know, diesel fuel. And when I was in Keene, New Hampshire and, and worked with biodiesel, it was obvious to me when I studied diesel that it's nasty stuff and, and it's really not a fuel that should be around kids. So um, I was very happy to, to really work on an electric school bus. Next slide, please. Boom. Okay, we did the pilot. We went out to bid, we put together a program opportunity notice. That's what a pond is in Massachusetts. <laughs> Everybody says, what's a pond? Well, it's not a body of water. It's it's a document that gets people to uh, apply for funding. So we did that. We actually had four schools responded, but the, the fourth school is a long story and I'm not gonna go into it. Um, <laughs> Brian will smile because he knows <laughs> about that <laughs> debacle over in Acton, um, Massachusetts. But Amherst, Concord, Cambridge, they they jumped in two feet. Um was was very interesting for us that um that we one of the rules was to have people own their own buses and have a depot. And and Cambridge came to us and they begged and begged and wanted to get a, a bus in their school system. And unfortunately they they contract their buses. <laughs> It turned out to be a somewhat of a debacle. They are using the bus, and but there were some issues there. So, so the, really, the pilot was best in in communities that own their own buses because they had a depot, they could deal with it. And um, so that was our program. We ran it. We required that everybody keep the bus for five years, and they've done that. Um, and in the beginning, if you have an opportunity, if you go to the Massachusetts Clean Cities, there is a report, a 44-page report. It's not the most flattering report, but it gives you information that provides, it will provide some very positive direction to go in. One of the things, you know, Elion was first to the table and they they built those buses within a time frame that was respectable. Um, we did have some issues with them, and um, but it's all been worked out and those buses are running. And, and Brian's gonna really get into more detail on with his experience in Concord. So, um, I certainly um, glad we did it, and sometimes it's hard to be first, but it's great to to have you know dipped our toe in the water and found out that it's actually a doable program now. That when we did it, there was only one company making that bus, Elion, and now there's a whole bunch, and that's wonderful. So it's it's, it's telling a good story now. So. I will turn this over. Do I have one more slide? I don't. So I will turn it over to Brian next. Oh, what we have learned. I have one more slide. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think number one is make sure your infrastructure is in place before the bus arrives. Our bus arrived in, in Cambridge and sat for a month before they got the charging station in, and that caused some issues. So get a plan together. Um, the RFP for the bus should really talk about service levels, and, and I know Kevin's going to speak to that issue very positively. And um, make sure if you go out to bid for buses, if your community wants buses, make sure you have the person who's in charge of the buses at the table knowing that you're going to get a bus because um, we had a case where a sustainably person was very excited about it, went and, and showed up and said, the day that she got the grant and went to the bus person and he said, what, we're getting an electric bus? I don't think so. So there, you want to make sure that, that everybody's involved when you, you make the plan to get EV buses. So Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Yeah, so actually, Brian, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just ahead. do a little quick intro for you. So our next pre presenter, thank you so much, Steve, is Brian Fold. Brian is a stay-at-home parent using his free time to help his town, Concord, Mass, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with practical solutions. Brian currently chairs Concord's Climate Action Advisory Board, which just released the town's first Climate Action Resilience Plan. And Brian's going to guide us through the procurement and implementation of electric school buses as one of the three school districts that participated in that 2016 Massachusetts pilot project. Brian, over to you. Oh, great. Um, so, yeah. So, 
thank you for the introduction. Uh, this slide kind of goes over that same thing. Um, there's a link there to the committee that I'm on and the plan if you're interested. Um, but yeah, why don't we go on to the, the next slide. And so I, I want to talk about kind of what started before the pilot, the pond became available, which was um, Concord at their town meeting, uh, the schools had come to town meeting asking for a million dollars above and beyond their current uh, budget to procure 10 diesel buses. And the residents in town meeting asked them to create a committee to look to alternatives for transportation fuels to get our students to and from school. Um, they were concerned about uh, the climate. They were also concerned about any health impacts and air pollution. Um, so if it, uh, the Alternative Fuel Committee was formed. Um, you can read here kind of what we were charged with and what the end result was and a link to our presentation. But it, it generally looked at all the different drivetrains that were available uh, for busing and it looked at the different fuels and the infrastructure needs for each of them, the cost of the vehicles themselves, and the cost to fuel them over time. And, uh, and generally, the conclusion that this committee found was uh, by, you know, biodiesel was a good alternative in the short term, but the real solution to these problems was electric vehicles, with the biggest barrier being the purchase price of the vehicles. Um, you know, they are quite expensive, and I'll get to that later. Um, so, next slide. So, once the committee had developed that, um, we had, you know, heard about the pond with Steve. Uh, we joined and were accepted into the pilot. Uh, we then, you know, once we received the pilot, we had to write an RFP as a school district to procure one of these buses, which was quite a heavy lift, seeing that that hadn't been done in the past. Um, so, you know, they're used to bidding for uh, diesel buses, uh, which, you know, as long as they meet the regulations, it's kind of the same routine each year. With an electric bus, there was a lot of particular questions and unknowns, so we did an RFP process instead of a bid. Um, and uh, we went on to, to then, you know, have it purchased, arrive. Um, there's all kinds of stories there. I'm kind of going over this quickly because I don't want to focus too much on, on these details. But going through being the first in the state to be inspected as an electric school bus, um, some of the challenges that came up there was we had 35 or so inspectors inspecting this one vehicle. It was every Massachusetts school bus inspector in the state went through this vehicle. And we found that some of the rules that we had to comply with because it was electric, uh, we didn't pass. Um, and it wasn't because it was dangerous. It was because the rules were written assuming diesel vehicles. So we had to work with the regulators on those. Um, one was we had the wheelchair lift on our vehicle. And it, there's a regulation about uh, locking the vehicle so that it doesn't roll away while the engine is idling to operate the lift. Well, with an electric vehicle, you're not technically idling. And there is, there is no way to, to roll the vehicle forward, so you don't have to do the lockout. Um, and so they, they worked with them um, to solve that. Uh, and then it was you know, training for the driver. Um, it, the vehicle drives very much like a bus. Um, with regen, regenerative braking being the main difference. Most school bus drivers have not felt the regen slow them down when they take their feet off both pedals, but they quickly become accustomed to it and some of them very much prefer it um, because it's, it's an easier way to operate. And then there was training and maintenance uh, for the foreman and our staff at the service center and uh, working with Lion at the time to, to learn about their vehicle and keep it uh, maintained and on the road. There was uh, the installation of the charger for Concord happened twice. We had built a brand new bus depot just by happenstance this, this similar year. And so we had to do an install when we had our old depot, then we did an install at our new depot. And you'd like to think that Concord would have learned the lesson of having the bus sit idle for three months on the first installation, but unfortunately it sat again for four months idle at the, the new depot when that was done because we, you know, lessons are learned slowly. <laughs> so definitely do not delay on charger infrastructure installation. Um, and then we started to operate the bus um, in 2017. 
Um, you can read the report about how it went and the troubles we had at the beginning. Um, I'm happy to say that today it's operating like any other bus. Um, it's got better uptime. It's, it's worked through its issues. Um, you know, we were first, so we, we took some of the big hits, but, you know, the software has been updated, the vehicle, you know, development has been refined, and, and right now it's operating as it should. Um, then we're, we're currently in the process of the Volkswagen settlement. So Concord as a town has decided that we want to get to an 80-20 fleet. We want to get to 80%, uh, you know, full electric school buses and 20% of either hybrid or diesel for any of those unusual runs or, or situations where they're needed. That is happening not at a de defined time frame. We're doing it when the money's available. And that's, that's the barrier. It's still that purchase price is the barrier. That's where we're going after every grant and funding opportunity we can um, to integrate these into our fleet. Uh, but without those 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 incentives, um, we can't really put, financially justify it over time. And I'll I'll get to that at the end. Um, and yeah, those are those kind of the stories that are going on right now. Why don't we go on to the the next slide? Oh, uh, the team. It's it's very important from the get go. If you are the champion, if you're the person who's asking your town or your your school district to adopt these vehicles, you have to be empathetic to the people who are going to operate this vehicle, to finance this vehicle, to uh, make it happen. Um, you can't set the expectation that this is just as easy as a diesel and everything's the same uh, because any little change and they will say, well, it feels different when I drive it because of regenerative braking or we had this you know, error code come up um, that our maintenance guys don't understand. Um, things are going to happen. So set the expectation that this is a better product, that it is going to be different, and that you as the champion will be there to support them as they deploy this vehicle. And that's very important. Um, and and that's that's really what I've done because I've uh, we deployed this bus in 26, well, I've been working on this for five years now. So, uh, you know, I've been the champion and and I've been there to support them at all levels um, throughout this process. Uh, next slide. So in New England, we have to think about cold weather operation. Uh, this is something where most of these buses, the, the big money, the incentives are in California. And California, generally it's sunny, it's beautiful. They have to worry about air conditioning their vehicles, um, not in all parts of California, but in many. Um, what often is forgotten is cold weather operation. So you have to make sure that you understand how the bus is heated, uh, whether or not the manufacturer asks for it to be sheltered. Uh, we, we have our buses out in a parking lot covered in snow. Uh, we don't shelter our vehicle. So if you have to, if the manufacturer is saying, we expect you to shelter this vehicle from the weather, it's a no-go for us. Um, so make sure you understand that about the, the, about the batteries. Also understand how much energy it's gonna consume in cold weather, keeping the temperature of that pack and whether or not the software can make sure that you're doing the bulk of the charging of the pack during hours when electricity is cheap, but that you're also preconditioning the vehicle right before it deploys for its run. Uh, so it uses grid electricity instead of battery range uh, to heat the cabin, for example, or to uh, make sure that all the, the mechanical parts are up to operating temperature. So, and if it does use the pack in cold weather to heat the cabin, um, understand the range loss that's involved in that. Um, work with manufacturers. Um, do they have uh, a heat pump for space heating or do they have resistance electric, which consumes more of that battery's energy? Um, and, and, and understand what you're getting into. That's that's the main thing is these buses all will work in cold weather. Just make sure that you know how they operate. Uh, next slide. So what did Concord really learn from participating in the pilot? Um, that you need a wide base of support that goes back to people, uh, making sure that 
you, you're, it's not one person in the community that's yelling loudest to make this happen and everybody else is forced to do it. Make sure it's collaborative, team focused, and the community desires this. Uh, and the community supports this uh, because you will have a much easier time going forward. Um, the other thing we learned is deploying a single bus is more difficult than deploying two. Um, so if you deploy a single bus, you don't have an example bus for the foreman to understand how a part goes back together or you don't you know when he's working on it he you when you're building infrastructure you're doing a service connection to charge that vehicle for one bus and that upfront cost all the upfront costs hit you with that first vehicle um, so deploying two um, or more I, I suggest five but that's you know financially that's a burden uh, so it's the more vehicles, the easier it is to deploy. It also doesn't become the redheaded stepchild that, you know, oh, that bus is broken. We'll ignore it because we don't need it. We'll focus on what we've always done, make sure that's operating, and then we'll get back to it. That, that takes it out of commission quite a lot. Um, don't delay on charger installation. Uh, as soon as you have a bus picked out that you're going to procure, uh, begin the work of you know, working with your school district on where that charge is going to be installed. Uh, make sure that you get the electrical union that's installing it for the school district on board or whoever else needs to be done in that process. It's There's a lot of steps in and bureaucracy. I can say that because I'm not employed by anybody, but yeah, bureaucracy involved in working with schools. Um, Owning your bus is easier than, than uh, you know, having a lease or working with a third-party busing service. Um, simply having control soup to nuts from who owns the vehicle to who operates it um, just makes decision-making easier. Um, there's less contracting involved, less uh, big meetings with multiple groups with different intentions. It's everybody's, um, it's just easier if you own your own fleet. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, third party busing, I know of a company in Massachusetts that is simply doing that. They're going to be the third party busing service that provides electric school buses. Um, and they have a whole business model around doing that. So this the third party busing is possible, but it is difficult. Um, local service and support, um, you know, at the time, Line didn't have a service center in Massachusetts. Um, so we had some customs delays when we had parts shipped from Canada to the U.S. Um, those kinds of things, you want to make sure you have local service or at least local parts uh, availability. And finally, the community loves the bus. Um, this is a picture of an event we had for electric vehicles in 2016. You can see the bus there under the solar canopy. Um, it's at Walden Pond, which is the, you know where Thoreau wrote his book. Uh, it's it's something that the community very much likes and one of the things these buses because they're so quiet they don't have the rumbling diesel engine they play music when they're under 20 miles an hour so some of the, some people refer to it as the singing bus because it, it has a noise emitter that goes through the neighborhoods every day as it picks up the kids it's not annoying or loud uh, but it is it is the singing bus and the, the kindergarten kids really love that uh, next slide just as long as they're not looking for ice cream when they get to the bus, yeah. that's all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had to make sure it wasn't the wheels on the bus <laughs> go round and round because we didn't want little kids trying to find the speaker and being, you know, <laughs> right. in the way of the bus as it was rolling. Huh? Yeah, so it's, it, I think it's the Montreal subway sound right now. <laughs> so it's just the whooshing. So one other thing that most people don't think of when they think about school buses is grid is is our electrical grid um, there are electric buses are essentially batteries on wheels uh, they have a duty cycle where they're sitting idle when people really want electricity from the grid so it's a really good match for the duty cycle of when it's idle and when it's operating where that battery can drive kids around in the morning and in the afternoon and then it can start to level out the grid's demand for electricity in the afternoons, lowering uh, operating expenses for the electrical utility. So this is why um, uh, there's vehicle to grid services. I could, I could go into this. this. This tends to get technical because it's all about the grid stuff. Um, but 
understand that Dominion Energy in Virginia is a great example of the value here, the financial value. They are deploying 50 of these buses uh, this year. They are planning to get to over 1,000 in Virginia by 2025, and then 100% of their school districts um, very soon after that. Uh, this is dependent on some things happening in the legislature, but the reason that a private company wants to help school districts with buses is because they want these batteries to deploy their energy and absorb the energy at certain times of day. They see a real financial value in those services. So there's, there's, there's value there, and that's why Dominion's putting up a lot of money to make this, this happen. So going on to, the, I believe, the final slide. Yes, so I hope everyone can see this. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's very hard to find one of these where it kind of looks at the total cost of ownership for electric buses. And the reason is we haven't deployed enough to have robust numbers. Um, so there's a lot of disclaimers on these. I just wanna share that. Uh, this is my best estimate of, of these kind of values. So the first column, is a diesel vehicle, the purchase price, um, you know, incentive funding, uh, what, it, what the infrastructure costs. And that 5,000 is a number that said, well, if I've got a depot and I've got to install a large diesel fuel dispensing tank, uh, that's gonna cost about $200,000 to install. And I'm gonna operate 40 diesel buses off of that. So its share for one bus is about 5,000. That's how that number is generated. And then the fueling, um, over the life of that bus for 12 years at 18,000 miles a year, it's going to consume um, $82,000 of fuel for that bus at $2.61 a gallon, which is, is the latest pricing I've seen on the alternative fuel website. And then maintenance, um, there's a lot of moving parts in these buses and they do have wear and tear and maintenance, and this, this is the best approximate value I could have for that. Obviously, some buses have more issues and some have less, um, but this is, this is roughly about what it costs. And then at the end of 12 years, that bus gets sold on, and uh, our school district is seeing about five to $7,000 for a trade-in value on our older buses, so that's, that's the 6,000. So over its 12-year life, we purchased that diesel bus at 100,000, but it cost the school district about 318,000 um, to have that vehicle in its fleet. And while it's in its fleet, it's producing CO2 emissions of almost 700,000 pounds, uh, which is quite a lot of emissions. Now, the next columns are all about the electric buses. So you can see at the purchase price, we're at three times to almost four times the cost at purchase. That's, that's a huge barrier to electric buses. And, and this pricing is pricing from, you know, that's old. So it may not reflect what the prices are today. Hopefully competition will start to lower those purchase prices. But in our, our states, uh, Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, uh, Volkswagen funding, uh, Concord received about $295,000 for the charger and the, the, the bus purchase for one bus. And the installation of that charging infrastructure would be about $9,000. Um, that includes the, the purchase of the pedestal, retractor, the charger, which is a level two charger at about 80 amps. Uh, and then uh, the trenching is, is the big part of that cost, the actual, you know, cost to put in the tube in the ground. Then the maintenance is less on these vehicles. So we had in our first report, we had some issues about maintenance because it was a first deployment of an electric school bus. Those have been ironed out. This bus has been running quite well and maintenance is starting to show that it's lower. Um, the grid services, this is this first example is just charging, um, at, you know, regular, just plugging in a bus and charging it. Um, it doesn't do any grid services or work with the utility. But yet, you know, at the end of its life, you can sell that battery for, you know, I'm, I'm guessing here about $7,500 and then the 6,000 for the vehicle itself. That, that nets out to a $200,000 cost for that vehicle over its lifetime. 
which is lower than its purchase price because mainly of that incentive. And the, the, the uh, CO2 emissions from the electricity within New England, um, this, the value of the emissions from a kilowatt hour uh, came from the New England ISO. So this is applicable to New Hampshire as well. Um, the reduction in carbon emissions is about um, you know, two thirds of a reduction from compared to the diesel. And, and that wasn't, I didn't plan it to be two thirds, it just the math worked out to be two thirds. And so I, I, the next examples I'm gonna go through more quickly, uh, deploying one bus versus two in Massachusetts, the Volkswagen funding has a cap in the program. So you don't get the full 300,000 incentive, you, you, it gets reduced to 500,000 or 250 per bus. And then it's a little bit more to buy the second charging unit and put that in. Um, the fueling costs would be double, the maintenance would be double, the grid services would be still zero, the sale would be double. And then the per bus, I actually divided by two here so that you can get a comparison of buying one bus or buying two. And you can see that the overall total cost of ownership on the life cycle of that bus is higher. It's, it's about $40,000 higher. And that's due to the reduction in the incentive above. And the emissions are, again, it's a reduction of about two thirds. The next two columns, similar to the other two, uh, but this time we add in the grid services. And you'll see that the EV charging infrastructure installation cost goes up quite a lot. And that is because those vehicle to grid uh, DC rapid charging, which is a level three charger, it can charge the bus instead of overnight, like eight hours, it will charge the bus in three hours. It will also discharge the bus in three hours. And those units are cost about $40,000. But the grid services you can receive from operating that with the utility, the utility could save over the lifetime of that bus about $147,000. So, and, and the second example is the same thing, except for it has a second dispenser, which means that you have the same $40,000 uh, charger, bi-directional charger, but you have two buses. You can rapid charge one and then the next. Um, so you only can do the discharging for one bus, and, but you can charge two of them. So you can see that if you buy two and you don't buy that second $40,000 charger, you can't double your grid services. It's capped. So the life cycle cost of that vehicle goes down to just about $60,000 with those investments and, those, and that, that cost to purchase. Oh, I forgot to mention on the purchase price, the reason that there's a difference is that the onboard inverter um, reduces uh, the cost of the vehicle uh, because the inverter is off the bus um, at the depot. So that's why there's a difference between the 365,000 and the 330,000. And you see down below that the, the percentages also change. So there's a huge reduction in cost when you're able to get that revenue from the vehicle to grid services. But the, the two thirds reduction in carbon, I've added a little plus there. And that plus is there because when this vehicle to grid services are being operated, what's happening is those peak events. When we have that summer weather and we have that call for that peak where everybody wants electricity, the dirtiest forms of electricity are being turned on. And by using the bus to discharge into the grid, we're avoiding turning on diesel generators to generate electricity and, and some of these, these assets. And while at night, we may be charging the bus off of wind energy, which is often a marginal energy in our grid. So there's, a, there's an additional carbon benefit for doing the grid, vehicle to grid services, but I don't know exactly the values of what that would be. So this is, the, this is what I put together as to kind of give you an estimate of what the financials look like, and I hope this gives you a good sense. Um, I don't want it to be taken as um, a gospel that if you do these things, you'll get this money. Um, this is still a very much a new market. Um, and you have to partner with the utility to see how much they'll share with the school district of that value. And it all depends on who puts up the money. So um, that's, those are my slides and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. 
I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> Thank you that much, Brian. Um, our final presenter today is Kevin King. Kevin holds the position of sales manager of the Eastern U.S. for school bus and transit bus sales for the Lion Electric. His strategic focus is on creating awareness for the industry, the Lion brand, and all of its products, as well as their economical, environmental, and intellectual benefits. Kevin comes from a successful career in telecommunications and information technology and formerly worked in the manufacturing side of the transportation industry for Boston Coach. Kevin's key driver is customer satisfaction. Kevin will walk us through the electric school bus technology and cold weather operation as Lion provided the buses for the Massachusetts pilot project. Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much, Jessica. And I'd like to start by thanking Steve and Brian, uh, both for their vision, their support, and, and most importantly, their patience. As uh, we go back to the early stages, has been alluded to a couple of times. Uh, the, VE, the initial rollout in Massachusetts was a learning process for both sides of this, uh, this transaction. And, and one of the key things we learned is you really should have the infrastructure in place before you deliver a bus because it's kind of hard to charge an electric bus without having that in place. But uh, nevertheless, there were significant challenges. We did our best to meet them. And with the support of Steve and Brian and the folks in Amherst and uh, uh, Cambridge, we, we persevered and we got through that. And, and we will be eternally grateful for helping to launch Lion on the road to where we are now as the leading manufacturer of electric school buses. So thank you both for your, your comments today and for your uh, assistance and patience throughout this process, process as well as your support. Uh, if we can go to the first slide. Uh, Lion today, we've come a long way since uh, November of 2016, January of 2017. We do have 300 employees uh, that are employed by Lion. That also correlates to about 2,000 indirect jobs in terms of the resources that are needed to uh, manufacture and uh, deliver and then implement an electric bus. Uh, our capacity right now, we're based in St. Jerome, Quebec, which is approximately 35 miles northwest of Montreal. We can manufacture up to 2,500 electric vehicles per year there. And as you'll see in a few minutes, we're not just doing school buses. Um, we currently have 300 plus, actually north of 350 school buses in operation at this point in time. And our buses have driven more than 6 million miles to this point. Um, we, when school is in session, we're generate, we, we travel approximately 25 to 30,000 miles each week transporting students. Uh, we have experience centers, and I'll get more into that in a second, in Sacramento, Los Angeles, and just outside of Albany, New York, and Green Island. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, our product roadmap. Uh, we were founded in 2008. We've been around for 12 years now. Initially, we manufactured uh, diesel buses. We went 100% electric in 2016, and our commitment and is to electric at this point. I know for sure, for a fact, that we recently turned down a very large diesel order from a legacy customer on the diesel side because we are 100% committed to electric at this point. In 2016, as we've discussed, we deployed our first Lion C buses in Massachusetts. In 2019, we, we added the Lion M, which is a commercial shuttle bus like you might see at the airport, capable of transporting up to 26 passengers. Uh, the Lion 8, which is a basically a box, box truck, and the Lion A, which is the Type A school bus. Our Type A will, will uh, accommodate up to 30 passengers. We have the Lion 8, which is politically correct term is a refuse truck, but it's a garbage truck. And if you can move to the next slide. Um, in 2020, we will be, uh, we have the Lion D, which is a passenger bus, a school passenger school bus that can accommodate up to 82 students. We will also have bucket trucks, and you may see these coming to some of your local utilities in the not too distant future. And in Q4, we will have the Lion 8 tractor, as well as the urban truck. The tractor, when I, when I personally thought of a tractor trailer, I think of what you see on the road driving to California from Maine and all these things. But the reality is the average tractor route is only about 200 miles or less per day. Our Lion 8 has a 300 mile range. Our Lion 8 tractor has a 300 mile range on it. So we believe that's gonna be a very viable part of the uh, product mix and will further help uh, in terms of our efforts to make the world an environmentally friendlier place. In 2021, we'll have Lion 5, Lion 7, Lion 8, 
We will be introducing an ambulance as well as boom trucks, again, gearing toward utilities and, and companies of that type. Um, we are 100% electric at this point. Next slide, please. We, we call our experience centers that because that's what they're there for. They're not just for service. They're not just for parts inventory stocking, but rather they are to enhance the electric experience of the communities in which they, they reside. And what I mean by that is we offer these facilities up for um, folks like Brian or citizens advocate groups that are big proponents of electric, uh, electric vehicles and want to further the cause. Clean Cities will host meetings for Clean Cities or local citizens advocate group in Albany, the Bethlehem Citizens for, for Clean Energy and things of that nature. So it's really an experience center so that you can uh, gain knowledge, gain information, and hopefully oftentimes experience hand on, hands on what we have to offer in terms of electric products. Currently, they're in Sacramento, Albany, Quebec, and Los Angeles. Los Angeles has opened. In 2020, we hope to have Fresno, Indiana. We're looking for a space in Massachusetts right now, Florida, Vermont, uh, Washington, and British Columbia. And in 2021, Colorado and Texas, and by 2025, we hope to be in the top 50 markets in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the map, which you see in blue, indicates where Lion has deployed buses, and something Brian touched on in terms of cold weather uh, viability of the buses and how they operate, how they function, and how they charge, and cost associated, and all that. You can see we have fairly extensive experience in that area. The majority of our deployments are in California, I would say half or more, but we do have significant experience in cold to extreme cold weather deployments uh, in Michigan, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, and, and environments such as that. So we uh, fully understand how to build the bus that will manufacture in just about any environment at this point in time. And we'll touch on that a little bit more later. Uh, next slide, please. Charging. Uh, right now, there's three levels of charging. No buses are using level one. That's pretty much what your Tesla is doing in your home garage or your Chevy Volt or anything along those lines. Uh, level two charging is somewhat of the industry standard at this point. It's the majority of what we have out there. It is a universal charging uh, component. The device you see there will fit in any level two charging uh, port. Um, if you go into your local mall and you see electric charging stations, unless it says Tesla on that, because Tesla has a unique charging uh, receptacle, you can charge a bus there. And if you look in the picture, you'll see our buses are mostly plugged into the front of the bus. Our standard charging port is in the front of the bus. However, we can uh, build and deploy buses with both front and rear charging if garage capacity requires that you back your buses into a facility. Uh, we do offer level three charging as well. As Brian alluded to, that is a faster charge, but it comes at a significantly greater cost. But it is something that we do option, do offer. Uh, we also will assist you in terms of assessing your sites and determining the best way to position or build out your infrastructure as well prior to the sale and delivery. Uh, next slide, please. It, to me, this is perhaps one of the most important distinctions as it relates to the value Lion brings to the industry at this point. We are a purpose-built electric vehicle. Our mission is electric. We do not build anything else. Um, we're in this business because we want to be in this business. We don't have electric products because we need to offer something to keep up at this point with what is rapidly becoming uh, a product very much in demand. This is what we do. Uh, an electric bus has only 20 parts on it versus diesel, some diesel buses that could have upwards of 2,000 parts. On an electric bus, you might have 7,000 parts, and that's every nut, bolt, rivet, anything that might go onto a bus versus 30,000 on a diesel bus. So there's other cost savings there and efficiency savings as you go forward in terms of parts inventory, parts stocking, and things of that nature. We build and manufacture our own chassis and bodies. They are not chassis that were designed to accommodate a diesel or a gas bus and have been retrofit to accommodate an electric bus. We assemble our own battery packs. We have more kilowatt available in our batteries than any other OEM on the market. 
our, our bus body is a composite body. There's not going to be any rust, no corrosion, no deterioration from road salt or anything along those lines, particularly in the step wells into the bus. That's an important feature of this product because particularly with the environment in which we now operate with federal funding, state funding being so uncertain, it's going to be easy to say, well, capital expenditures have to be cut at this point in time. So you may more and more have to maximize the investments you already have. An electric bus can certainly, we believe, be a, a viable 15 to 20 year bus as Lion builds and constructs that bus. Uh, we offer regenerative braking, which not, in, not only will help the brakes last three times longer, but they can also, if driven properly, extend the mileage range on the bus through what we call hyper mileage. Uh, as I already alluded to, our vehicles are not retrofitted. They are born to be 100% electric. And custom-built driver information center and clusters are included in our bus. We are tracking the data on your bus from the time you turn that bus on to the time you turn it off at night. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. Again, we are all electric. Lion A, we, we discussed it's a 30, up to a 30-passenger minibus. It has two ranges, uh, 75 to 150 miles, and the battery capacity is 160 kilowatts. Our Lion D, which we're just beginning to put into the manufacturing process now, uh, has a maximum power of up to 350 horsepower. An electric school bus is just like an electric vehicle. When you, stop, when you step on the gas, the response is immediate. Our buses are governed at 65 miles an hour, so you're not gonna have anybody out there doing 12 second quarter miles, but the bus is very responsive. Uh, the range on both the Lion C and D is our three options, 100, 125, or 150 mile, 155 miles, which is an industry best. The reason we build three different ranges is because we are sensitive to the increased cost of our product versus a traditional uh, school bus. It can be upwards of three and a half times greater. So there's no sense building one size fits all type of products in this, in, in this area because there is a cost that comes with that. So rather than squeeze everybody into a 155 mile or 125 mile bus, we will work with you so that your range, your needs, the demographics of your community can be accommodated in most cases by one of those three ranges and there's significant cost difference. Every step up in range can be an additional $30,000 in cost. So it's, we feel that's an important factor of the value we bring to the table as well. And the Lion C as, uh, again, 100, 125 and 155 mile range bus being a, uh, built to accommodate up to 72 students. Uh, green, uh, one electric bus has been touched on earlier, can eliminate up to 23 tons of greenhouse gases in each year. So, uh, if we can go to the next slide, Brianna, please. Heating, and this is one of the great challenges that we and other manufacturers experience at this point in time. An electric heater will have a significant impact on the range of the bus. If you use electric heat, you will use upwards of four to six or perhaps even more depending on the temperature, the environment, uh, the number of students, how often you're up stopping, opening and closing the door, uh, four to six kilowatts per hour. So you can drain the battery. You can, you can cost upwards of 10, even 20% of your range using electric heat. Uh, there are preheat set settings to heat the cabin while it's plugged in using the energy from the grid, not the bus. And in some cases, that's mandatory in certain states to have an electric heater. Uh, the one that sticks out the most for us is California. California does not allow auxiliary heaters, but frankly, in California, they don't really need a heater that much. So it's easy to pass that law for them there. Um, what we have been deploying on just about every bus we've delivered in cold environments is an auxiliary heater. Um, it uses no electric power during its operation. It does not draw or eliminate or reduce battery range. Uh, the preheat seating uh, setting to heat the cabin while plugged in uses the energy from the grid still, so you're not using your auxiliary diesel heater and, and emitting uh, NOx into the air. It has a 25 gallon tank. And typically we find, uh, we have folks in Michigan that just reported to us in the past winter season which was abbreviated to some extent with the COVID uh, shutdown. Uh, they utilized approximately 72 gallons on average this, this past winter. Um, it's not the best scenario. We're working toward one of two solutions. 
uh, being able to gain the battery efficiencies we need in offer electric heat, or in the alternative, uh, an auxiliary heater that does not emit any emissions at this point in time. But those are in the R&D stage, and, and uh, we hope to be able to introduce new products and new offerings around those uh, that effort in the not too distant future. Uh, next slide, please. Lion electric school buses in extreme temperatures. Has been alluded to earlier that some manufacturers will ask or in even somewhat require that if you're getting one of their electric buses, you store it indoors in the winter season. That is not a requirement with Lion. It, it's not an issue at all for us. Where you will see some challenges in cold or extreme cold environments is the time to charge the bus will take longer. In an extreme cold environment, we have seen Perhaps charging time can take instead of six to eight hours, it may take upwards of 12 hours to heat a bus, but it will in no way, shape or form impact the range that that bus will then have once it's deployed the next day on its route. If it's a 100 mile bus, you'll still be able to drive it 100 miles, 125, 125 and so on and so forth. That's below 32 degrees. From 32 to 60 degrees, you will charge at about 75% efficiency and again, maintain 100% state of charge or the effective range that the bus was built for. Uh, from 60 to 80%, no additional, uh, 60 to 80 degrees, no additional charging time is required. 105 to 113, the same thing, your max uh, charging will uh, occur within the recommended timelines or the, or the uh, assumed timelines with 100% state of charge. 113 to 122, the same. And 122 and over, well, that's a bit of a challenge for us at this point, but I don't think in New Hampshire, having lived there most of 2018, 2019, we'll have any uh, issue. Uh, we don't anticipate that getting uh, too warm over 122 degrees. And actually to update that number, we now have, we can now operate at 130 degrees. And the reason why we're doing all that research is because we're looking into the Phoenix markets and it could heat up a little bit there in the summertime. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, has been alluded to, and, and Brian was eloquent in showing the savings you can realize in an electric diesel, uh, electric bus versus diesel. 80% energy reduction costs, 60% on maintenance. You know, we just finished a, a Volkswagen uh, project in New Jersey, and the question everybody asks is, what's involved with uh, the maintenance of an electric bus? And the somewhat easy answer is tires, brakes, and windshield wipers. Uh, there's not a lot, no oil changes, obviously, none of that stuff's involved. So it's fairly easy to, uh, to maintain the bus. Uh, in terms of energy cost reduction, right now uh, we see about an average of 1.4 miles per kilowatt of uh, power expended. Using, if you say you're paying about 13 cents per kilowatt, you know, you're going to go roughly the same amount of miles you would on a gallon of diesel gas for about 65 cents. So that offers significant savings as you deploy these vehicles. And I know we're running out of time here before we get to questions, so next slide, please. Uh, I won't get too into this. It doesn't present real well on the uh, slide here, um, but we can do a, uh, a total cost of ownership analysis for you. Any schools, contractors who are in on this call, if you're interested, we could sit down with you, discuss what your needs are, discuss what your current routes are, the mileage that you use, and we can uh, give you a fairly good assessment of what your costs would be over the, say, a 12 to 15 year life of the bus relative to what it would be for a gas or diesel bus. And as Brian illustrated er earlier, there can be significant savings in, in those areas. So, uh, but again, I will, uh, you know, my contact information will be available. Anybody interested, simply reach out and we'll do this personally with anyone we, that is uh, so desires. Next slide, please. Uh, as has been discussed, uh, the cost of the bus can be significant, and, and we do understand, again, capital dollars may be at a premium for God knows how many years going forward with the money the government's had to expend in other areas just to keep our economy going, and who knows what's going to now filter down to, to schools. So we have partnered with a, a very large, perhaps the largest utility in the United States to offer a turnkey solution. And what we'll do is we'll take it from basically an OPEX model. So instead of spending $400,000 per bus, we can work out a fixed monthly cost that will include the bus, maintenance on the bus, 
infrastructure assessment, infrastructure deployment, infrastructure maintenance. And it's a very unique situation. We've just uh, reached a memo of understanding with this utility provider, and this is something we'll be bringing out to you guys very shortly. Uh, next slide. The Lion experience is something that has grown through the years. It's, it's what happens uh, uh, prior to and after delivery. We will come in, we will spend six, eight, or however many hours we need to training your technicians, your maintenance teams. Uh, we can do a lot of remote maintenance through our telematics. We've just enhanced our telematics. Uh, with the enhanced telematics, you no longer need to buy a smart charger. You could save money there buying what's called a dumb charger because some of those features that are on a smart charger like programming and things of that nature, we could offer through a dumb charger with our enhanced telematics. Uh, we have 24 hour part centers and availability across uh, North America and that will be expanding. Dedicated service teams, including trainers and technicians, and we can leverage our national and regional service networks. Part of what we'll do also when we deliver the vehicle is we'll invite your first responders. We'll invite your, your uh, DOT inspectors. We'll invite anybody that may have to deal with this bus that does not have a lot of experience dealing with this bus so we could familiarize them with the vehicle, help them understand the best way to uh, make sure it's operating the way it should be for DOT, know how to properly inspect the vehicle and things along those lines. So I know we've run long here and I apologize. So that's the end of our presentation and I'll turn it over for questions. Great, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so let's open the floor up for questions. And I think Brianna, you'll go ahead and, uh, and share those with us. Yes, definitely. So let's just head right here. Okay. So um, first question that we have is actually going to be directed towards um, Brian. And somebody had actually two questions um, related to, I believe, the total cost of ownership um, model that you had mentioned. And the question is, do you know the capacity in kilowatts of the bi-directional charger that you used? Um, so the bi-directional charger is a 60 kilowatt uh, bi-directional system. Okay. And then um, following up on that, did you use $10 per kilowatt hour per month for the entire 12-year period of the bus life? Say, say that again? Sure. Did you use the $10 kil per kilowatt per month for the entire 12-year period of the bus life? Uh, yes. I think they're referring to the RNS charging. Uh, charges, which is a utility expense based on um, it, it, RNS charges, are for taking the energy from the generation center to the distribution network, and those charges are accrued by the just uh, by the utility as kind of like a, a commercial demand charge, and uh, those have been going up over time, and right now they're around ten dollars a kilowatt um, for that hour each month. So it's it's one charge for one hour each month, and it's $10 for every kilowatt coming in, and then and that happens each month. So if you can have a level load, it's cheaper, which is where the vehicle to grid service comes in, because you shift load to level that out, thus avoiding that charge. Great, thank you. We had a question come in for Kevin, and um, the question is, can you speak at all about the current state of vehicle to grid with Lion? Uh, at the present time, we are in the final stages of preparing for what I believe will be uh, the first vehicle to grid deployment in the U.S. I see Brian making me a, a little face there. Um, it'll be White Plains, New York. It will involve five units. Um, the last of those units, I believe, has just been retrofitted. We're working with uh, Con Edison, the utility company in New York on that, and had the scenario or the situation of the last several months not been in play, we probably would have deployed by this point. I'm not sure what our, our actual deployment date is now at this point in time. Okay, great. And to follow up on that, are there any necessary upgrades to make electric buses ready for vehicle to grid capabilities or do they arrive like that? Uh, we, our buses now uh, do not, uh, as a standard arrive as that. If that's something you'd like, we can certainly include the necessary hardware infrastructure for that. Uh, when manufacturing the vehicle. 
Okay. Uh, another question for Brian. Um, do you know the um, capacity of the solar panels that were shown in the background of um, several of the pictures that you used? And is there um, any data you might have on whether or not those panels are enough to charge the bus or how much square footage of solar might be needed to charge a bus? I, I don't know how much would be needed to charge a bus, but I do know that Concord Light, our town-owned utility, operates that solar array, and it's 5.5 megawatts. So it's a utility-scale array, uh, and that is our depot uh, being constructed for where we store our buses. So that um, I know that that installation of solar um, has us with a duck curve on our distribution system, and uh, we need utility-scale storage there as well as um, using our electric bus fleet to help level that load, uh, mostly during the summer. Uh, it's, it's those spring days on Sunday, you know, in the morning when that array is generating a ton of power and people in town are at church and not utilizing that power that we have to charge something and create demand. So those buses are a great use for that. Excellent. A uh, question, I think this would be more directed towards Kevin. How much do you insulate the body of the bus in order to help preserve heat? We, I, that's a great question. I apologize. Um, I, I will uh, get back to Brianna and Jessica with that answer. The reason why I'm uncertain, we have just upgraded our insulation in the bus, and I'm not sure what the new standard is, but I will respond back to Brianna and Jessica with that information. Okay, great. Thank you. A uh, question for Brian, was cost or the length of time required to charge the bus more important in deciding which level of charger to use? Oh, which level of charger? So um, I, it was really the, the lack of availability of the bi-directional until recently uh, that that option has really come, come around. So the charging infrastructure has to uh, be financially justifiable. Uh, back in when we did the first deployment, uh, it was a level two charger because we didn't see vehicle to grid very soon. And if we did, we saw it at a smaller scale. Um, so that, that was the investment we made then. Uh, we are, Concord is currently, uh, has been awarded uh, funding in the first round of Volkswagen to purchase one electric school bus. And uh, we're hoping to do uh, vehicle to grid or at least build the infrastructure to be ready to do vehicle to grid. So we're looking more at that uh, one bus plus V to G um, installation. In Brian, the V to G has to be done through a DC fast charger, correct? Yeah. So. Um, it, earlier, um, Lion was proposing a um, AC to AC vehicle to grid system, but I don't think that came to fruition. Uh, the DC to DC uh, is what is was really um, seen in the market right now, uh, which is that larger scale um, uh, $40,000 bi-directional inverter installation. Great, thank you. So we have a question uh, relating back to Jessica's presentation and um, I'm just gonna read the question as it's right. stated. So Jessica mentioned there hasn't been much interest in New Hampshire in the grant money that's on the table for these issues in the past. Can you summarize your pitch on why this is an important change to prioritize for climate response and economic reasons? I think ultimately, there are so many factors that are important to consider, but I think as, as all the presenters here today have kind of pointed out, it takes time to put together um, a project to plan for a pilot. So I think really what I'm trying to emphasize today is that we've got time now to be looking at um, how to put something together to move New Hampshire forward in this capacity. And certainly with COVID-19 being uh, respiratory if a pandemic here in our nation, now is the best time to be looking at zero emissions options for New Hampshire. So now's the time. 
Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. All right, let's see. So the next question um, for Brian, did you find that the buses were available at the right times to be able to reduce the transmission peaks? So I, I, I wanna be clear, we haven't deployed the vehicle to grid yet. So I don't have uh, specific data on peaks in, that we've discharged into. We have controlled charging, um, to avoid peaks and, and adding load. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that we deploy vehicle to grid because as Kevin said, uh, Lion is doing the, the first deployment in New York. Um, I know that the other manufacturers have their own deployments um, that they're doing. Um, and we're we are hoping to be very early on those lists. But it's, it's mostly, the vehicle to grid is mostly driven by the savings we could see through our town owned utility. So. Uh, we know what the, the expenses are uh, through them and, and their desire to avoid those expenses. Okay, great, thank you. Know, you. I just point out also, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily have to be vehicle to grid, it could be vehicle to building. You don't have to redirect this power to the grid per se, you could redirect it to your campus and, and further uh, see economical savings in that regard as well. So there's gonna be a whole plethora of options as it relates to vehicle too. Yeah, one of the things that I haven't seen yet is um, in the Clinton Global Initiative, which was really the kickoff for that funding, um, they were talking about these as emergency deployment. Of, so you could drive this bus to a building, connect it, and power that building if there was a blackout. Or you could park it where people could charge their phones and have emergency power uh, to operate tools or, or other things, because it is quite a large pack. And, uh, and acts like a mobile generator. Right. It's, that is getting a lot of attention, particularly for areas that are uh, prone to tropical the storms, other piece. things of that nature. Steve? Right. And the other, the other piece we, we looked at was um, the whole issue of if your building has an energy management system, it's going to know when, when your peak load is going to hit. And if you have that plugged into your energy management system, you're going to avoid that peak demand. And, and that that's something that Lincoln Labs has proven and, and worked with. And I think that's a huge savings and cost. If you can keep those peak loads down in your building um, with demand rates going where they are today. So I think that was the other piece we wanted to look at, which I think is a, a simpler solution to the vehicle to building and it easily doable. Great, uh, question for Jessica. Um, you mentioned um, two other uh, electric school bus companies, uh, Thomas and Bluebird in, in your presentation. And do you know if either of them have made an electric bus available in New Hampshire yet? As far as an electric project in New Hampshire, I'm, I'm not aware of any. Um, but I think that um, there's a lot of fabulous manufacturers out there that would love to see the electric buses deployed in New Hampshire. Definitely. Yeah, they, they, they're definitely okay. willing to deploy in New England. I don't think they have deployments, mm -hmm. but they're willing to. Great, that's good to hear. Uh, Kevin, a question for you. Is a heat pump heating and cooling system for the bus on your product development roadmap? Yes, it is. Yep. Um, Ryan, did you want to say something? Oh, Who's no, I, I, I love that idea. Um, I, I know how efficient uh, heat pumps can be. I know yeah. they add vibration to the vehicle, so they need some real design. Uh, but I'm, I would be excited to see that instead of a resistance electric heat. I was just going to say to to add to what Brian said, the technology is fundamentally there. It's the way to uh, effectively deploy it on the product on the bus at this point in time, without impacting the uh, the vehicle in uh, in terms of the ride and comfort and things of that nature that we're working through at this point. All right, a uh, question for Brian or Kevin. Um, did either of you look at any of the transportation as a service providers such as Nuvi? I'll let Kevin take that. 
Uh, Nuvi is our partner on the V2G project in uh, at White Plains in New York City or in White Plains, New York uh, with Con Ed. Okay, excellent. All right, for Jessica, um, do you know if the New Hampshire utilities and state energy rules allow for the same things that they were able to do in Massachusetts? And I believe that is referring to the um, types of grants that were available maybe for whether or not they were eligible, um, if you have to own the bus, or if you can work with a contractor on a grant? I think that's a great conversation that interested districts should have with their utility. Um, you know, reach out and talk with them. I think probably the bulk of, of schools are in uh, Eversource, Liberty Utilities, Unitil, or New Hampshire Electric Co-op. I think, you know, talk with your, your utility about their plans and, and what's um, you know, what's doable. Uh, I would just tell you that right now, Eversource is engaged in parts of Connecticut, uh, exploring the possibility of participating in some pilot programs there. So I would say they would be a, an attentive uh, party right now if you, if you approach them. Great. I think uh, the next question would be towards um, Steve uh, or Jessica. Do you know any if any school districts in New Hampshire actually own their buses? Yeah, well, I do know of school districts in New Hampshire that own, yep. But it does seem like there also are a lot that do contract out. And obviously from the poll that we took earlier, um, some interest in, or a lot of uh, some folks leasing as well. So something to consider there. I, I spent time with the city of Keene's school board, just getting them to put biodiesel in their buses. And we had students go to a, a school board meeting and we had big discussion. And then we went to first student and they said, you got to talk to Texas. We don't, we don't make those decisions here. And so in, in some cases, these conglomerates who run bus companies are, are, are going to be the last nut to crack. Um, you know, unless they become the UPS of the world where they make a corporate decision and go electric and they, they get a contract and run with it. I would not spend any time with those folks at this point <laughs> to get them to go electric, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, there are, there are companies that can help you do that that are on the opposite side of that spectrum, um, like Highland Electric. They're, they're, whole plan is to to compete with those guys using electric buses so there's mm -hmm. at least one option out there true true thank you and um, we are running um close to the end of our time here so i do want to turn it over to jessica for some closing remarks all right yes yeah, so we'll wrap up q a and thank you everyone again for participating um, if your question wasn't an answered or acknowledged, please feel free to follow up with either Bran or myself after uh, the webinar. And um, Bran, did we want to administer one more poll before we close out or? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Right. So um, our poll here, we are interested to know um, for those on the line, what stage are you at in the process to integrate electric school buses in your communities? So that should be live. We'd love to have your answers. Just give it a couple couple of seconds and seeing the answers come in. All right, so let's see what our results are. Looks like about 60% are in the aspirational phase, so just starting, uh, about a quarter in the early phase, and 11% um, are starting to gather more support. Excellent. Well, I would like to say, you know, regardless of what lies ahead, if you want to accelerate the transition to electric in your community, you need to engage your local decision makers in moving that needle. Don't wait for future funding or procurement opportunities to start planning. Educate yourselves and develop a plan now. Be prepared so when the time is right, you're ready to charge ahead. 
Awesome. And thank you so much to all of our presenters today and for everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Have a good day, all. Yep. Take care. See you. Bye.